All right, we're going to go uh, sort of each side of the ball, coaching matchup and X Factors. Remember, our official picks for this game uh, will be coming a little bit later. We'll do some best bets also on Monday's show. The day of the game, uh, we should have player props by then. That was something that we introduced last year. I think that was a lot of fun. So on the day of the game, Monday, January 8th, we will be doing our player prop best bets. We'll drop some of our best bets for the game, our official picks on Thursday, which, of course, is normally a locks uh, episode during the season. We're going to begin with Washington's offense against Michigan's defense, and we begin – with the news breaking in the last you know, 12 to 15 hours, that running back Dylan Johnson, who dealt with a foot injury early in the year and who after the game, uh, Washington said, Washington coach Kalen DeBoer said that, you know, it, it appeared to be a re-aggravation of that foot injury. Well, offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb has since said x-rays were negative. They're expecting Dylan Johnson to play in the game. Incredibly significant, especially how important Johnson has been in some of the biggest games of the season. Um, we can address that. We don't need to address that like in a big picture unless you would like to start there. Tom, you've got your Huskies hoodie on. Washington's offense against Michigan's defense. What are the tilting points in this matchup? The guards. Um, Washington's offensive line won the Joe Moore award. It's a good offensive line. I don't know if it's the best in the country. I, I mentioned this on Twitter yesterday because we, we talked about it on the show with Michael Penix. I don't think this offensive line wins the Joe Moore award with most other quarterbacks. I think mm -hmm. Michael Penix's ability to avoid sacks helped them out a lot as far as like people just looking at the stats and like sacks allowed and all that kind of stuff. But I think when I look at this Washington offensive line, at the tackle spots, they're good. At the center, they're good. I think both their guards are fine but I think they are helped out by the guys they're surrounded by. And when I look at this Michigan defensive line and I look what it did against Alabama and they crushed the right side or the left side of Alabama's offensive line in the Rose bowl. But the interior is where Michigan is. And we saw it against Texas, Byron Murphy and Devontae sweat played well. They did not, you know, they, they were winning most of those battles. They weren't getting to Penix, but they were winning the battles and they were bringing pressure. Michigan is going to do the same thing. The difference is Michigan has guys at the end who are better than I think what Texas had. It's a more complete defensive line. It is, has more depth on the defensive line. And it is going to be imperative for Washington to, in the middle of that line, to hold up against that, especially with Dylan Johnson, because based on what I saw, I don't know if he's going to be 100%. Mm. Like, he might be willing yeah, to play. Do you buy that? Because I'm yeah. – I'm... yeah. Like that I was, don't buy what, what that was not a is. nice look. That was a high ankle sprain looking ass injury to me. So I, I, I don't know that they're going to be able to run the ball that effectively. And as good as Penix is, and as great as those receivers are, if Michigan doesn't have to worry about your run game, it becomes a lot simpler to at least slow down the passing attack. And I do think that this Michigan defense, like, no, they have not seen a set of receivers like this this year. But the defense, like for years, Michigan couldn't beat Ohio State. This team was built with the idea of we have to stop C.J. Stroud, Marvin Harrison, Chris Olave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, all these dudes. And then they did it. It's the same defense. It's the same principle. So it's not like this isn't something that Michigan has dealt with in the past. So I think that the key for Washington's offense will be to find a way to win on the interior and be able to at least give a semblance of a run game. And maybe we see like we saw in the Sugar Bowl, they use Penix more as a rusher just to keep the Michigan defense honest. Because, again, if you allow them to play one-dimensional on defense, they're going to win. I think a big part of this is daring the Washington receivers to make the same contested catches again. And so like I just don't believe that you're going to be able to do that again against our secondary. No, I I think that they can definitely make contested catches. Can they make them at the same rate that they made them against Texas? That seems like something that if, if I'm Michigan's D coordinator, I would like to see again. We sure we're going to do that? We sure the ball placement's going to be that perfect again? Are we sure the sack avoidance is going to be like teleportation good again? <laughs> I mean, the, the elusiveness in the pocket and Pennock's ability to get his eyes back up and immediately find the right guy again, it, it speaks to him having such a great knowledge and maturity 
of understanding what that offense is and who's going to come open and win and why. But still, the, the avoidance in the pocket of some of those guys who came free, that was special. But I want to see if it's repeatable. Because if I'm Michigan and it is repeatable and he repeats it, I'm cooked. Right? I mean, it. Texas got some pressure up the gut, to Tom's point. And Washington's run game was not humming. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Washington does such a great job of scheming and formation you, and obviously Penix knows where to go with the ball, of constantly having somebody open. Very few negatives. They're constantly moving forward. They don't get in a lot of like third and long type situations. You know, is Texas willing to challenge that? Or excuse me, is Michigan willing to challenge Washington in a way that Texas was not? And for good reason, they were not, right? The Texas defensive backs are not great. We talked about this. Like, is Texas probably a, a better team than Washington? I think on power numbers, yes. On matchup, no, right? You know, can Michigan be a little more aggressive, a little tighter with its coverage and be willing to live with the consequences? And the answer to that is probably about the other side of this of this matchup. How many points do you think you can score if you're Michigan? How much do you believe in this Washington defense? Right? I I don't know. But if you go with the aggressive route, if you really challenge these receivers, can you get away with it? Because there's a downside to that if you do and Penix cooks you for 45. Yeah, or, I mean, there were a couple of pass interferences, too, in that game mm -hmm. where just, like, players got beat and all of a sudden, yeah, you know, you extend it by 15, you extend a drive right there. Uh, to your earlier point, my assumption is that there are two levels to the Dylan Johnson thing. You could call it gamesmanship, sure. Um, but I, and I, I'm not just trying to be soft coming out of being really close to that team. But they love that dude. And I know he just showed up, but they they really love I think that they are gonna let him wear the pads, go out for warm-ups, and like, yeah, maybe give the impression of it. But let's let's be honest. When Jesse Mentor, the defensive coordinator for Michigan, is sitting down and sweating, yeah, he wants to make sure that they stop the run. But what he's really sweating about is about how to stop one, two, and eleven. Like and how, how to contain nine. Like that, those are the things that Michigan's defense will be based around. And I do think that if they are able to run the football effectively, like Dylan Johnson has been a huge part of it, but running the football effectively probably has to do with the five guys up front being able to block and being able to get a push to the point where uh, you're able to call it up, draw it up, and get the running plays you need. And if you're Michigan, you, you need to see some of this, right? Like you need Penix to pat the ball and hold the ball some, yeah. right? And that, that has not been something that Texas made him do it's not something that Oregon made him do very well. And really, when he was healthy, almost nobody's been able to make him do so. But that I think that is part of the, of the way that you start to get hits on him. I mean, he was not touched a whole how many How many actual hits did Texas have on him? Not a ton. Well, there's zero sacks. Um, right, exactly. Yeah, I, I, and quarterback hurries, I think, are less than three or four. I mean, it was – and in a couple of them, like he had two times that he threw the ball away. I'm sorry, I'm going off the top of my head. Don't have it. But I know then there were also two or three times that he had somebody in his face and he just delivered a – not a strike, but like finds the guy underneath in the middle of the field just to be able to like keep things moving forward, to your point, with like a no negative plays type situation. P PFF ha has uh, Texas as recording zero quarterback hits. I don't know if that's accurate, but that, that – uh... Like yeah, Penix so has their his definition own transfer is, portal. He just moves from one end of the pocket to the other. <laughs> yeah, the, their definition is hits allowed. So a pass rusher knocks a quarterback down as or after he releases a pass. If Michigan records zero quarterback hits, Michigan is not going to win the game. Yeah. I don't even need a bunch of sacks, but I, I do need him to be hit if I'm Michigan. But Jenkins, Grant, Graham, Stewart. Stewart just coming in the game on a third down situation to come mm -hmm. in there and, and like make you move with his ability to come off the edge. This is, let's see, let's play that game again. It's the best defensive front in football. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and it's not close. Like, I mean, I know Texas has sweat and Murphy, but the rest of it does not compare to what Michigan has at every spot. Yeah. yeah it was so sweat funny. might be the best of all those, but Michigan is deeper and, and, and mm -hmm. they're, yeah. I was talking to a scout on Monday night. He was saying that he thinks Murphy's going to run a four, eight at the combine that they had Murphy. Byron? They, yeah. That yeah, they he might. Yeah. <laughs> he was working a camp for Herman 
when Murphy was in high school and they, they, he was like talking about the, I didn't know about all this, the, the risk measurements, like all the projection software that they have where they like, they measure like neck wrist, like all mm -hmm. these other things. And then they figure out what you're going to be down the line. And that Murphy was sweat was the, the deep defensive player of the year. I was talking about like, I love this guy. I think he's incredible. They're like in terms of NFL, like Murphy might end up being just right there. If not picked even higher in terms mm -hmm. of the, the defensive line in the NFL. We don't need to talk about those losers name. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so best best defense. And I do love that in if I could put my bud pants on real quick. Um, we did say on this podcast, Michigan has the defensive line that everyone thinks Georgia has. Remember? Mm -hmm. Where yeah. it's like that's like that's that's the best group. And so that will be uh, an incredible challenge for uh, an offensive line that I did get the the did get the upper hand on Texas, but even within that, uh, made a couple mistakes along the way. So they, they got to be able to clean that up, uh, going up against a, a challenge that's going to be even more, <clears throat> even more daunting. All right. Let's flip to the other side, Michigan's offense against Washington's defense. I think that Washington's defense statistically as a whole looked like, and I think I might've said this on Monday night. If you were to put all of the playoff teams, offense, defense together, it looks like Washington's defense would be like among the lower ranked uh, units in this game. I thought they did. A, I thought they did a very good job of um, defending Texas. I think Texas also didn't run the ball as much as they were successful at running the ball. I thought that Texas had a lot of success running the football. And here comes Michigan and Blake Corum and a team that seems to be on a mission to run that daggum football. So how is this Washington defense? What's going to be the key uh, stacking up against this Michigan attack? Can you make Michigan get into passing situations on third down? Like it's, I mentioned this on whatever day of the week it was that the playoff game was, because I genuinely have no idea what day of the week it is anymore. But like Blake Corum is not as good this year. And I got a lot of heat from it from Michigan fans. I, I know he ran for 25 touchdowns, but he's also averaging 4.7 yards per carry after averaging over six the last two years. He's not the same player. The knee injury has had an impact on him. And I thought it was a problem. The reason why Michigan was in so many third and longs was because Corum wasn't having a ton of success on the ground until that overtime. And also, Donovan Edwards was pretty much completely wiped out by the Alabama defense, too. He wasn't having any success on the ground. They need both of those guys to show up in this game. Donovan Edwards is very important to them. Donovan Edwards right now is the home run threat on that in that rushing game. Blake Corum is not. And I think they need him to play better because you can run the ball against this Washington defense. Like, Braylon Trice is phenomenal. Braylon Trice is a much better pass rusher than he is a run defender. And I think that you have to take advantage of that. And I think that if you can't, if you get into third and long situations, we saw what Braylon Trice did to Texas. And you look at this Michigan offensive line, I think in that game they deserve a ton of credit for how well they played. Trent Jones came in, a senior for Zach Center, and performed very admirably against that Alabama defensive front. But they still have problems at tackle. And Braylon Trice moves around. You're never exactly sure where he's going to come from, but I'm guessing he's going to be on the right tackle more often than not, especially in third and long situations. They've got to they've got to stay out of third and long because if JJ McCarthy in that game, like the limitations were evident when you put him in that spot. He is when you get him outside the hash marks with throws. He's not as accurate as he is between the numbers. And Alabama clearly focused on that because one of the most interesting things I saw Alabama do in that game, first snap of the game, you know who Terry and Arnold was covering? Colston Loveland. He wasn't even covering one of their receivers. He was covering the tight end. And it is going to be interesting to see what Washington does with that because clearly Alabama felt that their tight ends were the more dangerous weapons than the wide receivers. And for the most part, it was an accurate assessment because they completely shut the tight ends down. They did make some plays. So I look at Powell, who plays the slot corner for Washington more often than not. Muhammad is healthy. He is their best corner. He apparently came in at the end of the Sugar Bowl. I missed it, but I'm assuming if he came, yeah, he came back, the game, he'll be playing in this game. 
Where they put him is interesting, although he typically plays on the ex exterior, so I don't think they're going to bring him to the interior. Powell has mostly been their slot guy. I'm guessing he's going to be on Loveland. He's going to be on Barner. How good of a job he does in coverage will be very important to the Washington defense because it'll force McCarthy to make the throws he's not as comfortable making. And then, yeah, and I'm getting lost here, but can McCarthy make throws from the pocket? Because clearly they weren't comfortable leaving him in there against Alabama. Game script will matter quite a bit, obviously. Uh, if, if Washington comes out real hot as and, and DeBoer is an excellent, like excellent opening series type guy. He, he, he's, I think he's actually profitable in the blind um, on on some of this first quarter stuff. But ch check me on that before you follow that. That's not actionable. So game script will matter a lot, obviously, and that that's, seems like a no, no dub, but. I think you can run the ball some on on Washington, but it's really an I think because they did not face a lot of kind of hit you in the mouth type run games. Mm. Uh, the team that I would say is most comparable is probably that Oregon State team. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had, uh, it's what, Fagua and who's the guard? Bloomfield? Fuaga and, and were, Bloomfield, yeah. They were both hurt, but they both played if i recall and martinez didn't have amazing numbers but they did you know pretty consistently move the chains until washington bowed up in the red zone now in fairness if i recall in that game they did not have what asa turner one of the safeties and washington was missing somebody else too and in the game it was kind of just crazy uh pacific northwest conditions oh, it was raining mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but in terms of like teams that'll get in heavier formations and run the football at you they, they didn't see a lot of that this year so there is a bit of an open-ended question as to how washington will play that that's not me saying they can't do it we just we don't know how many times did washington face like two tight end looks or you know m more kind of 21 type personnel we, we don't really know um uh, oregon state does it some Utah, when they had healthy tight ends, could do it, but I don't. I doubt they saw much of it in that game. Oregon does not do it a whole lot. Who else under schedule? Arizona State, no, because their, their tight ends were hurt a lot this year. Mm -hmm. Trying to they think. Don't face power run games, really. Boise didn't. Michigan State doesn't even really count because they were game scripted out of that game so fast it really didn't matter. It's like twenty eight um, to nothing five minutes into the game. <laughs> right, not running a whole lot of two tight ends when, when you're down yeah. twenty eight. So. My point here is that there is a bit of an unknown as to Washington's defense when it has to face a, a bit high, a, a, like a, a beefier. Well, yeah, like think about uh, Zion to Puli Fatui. Like it, you've got somebody on the outside who is an edge rusher. He's like 250, 260 pounds. And when he's not having to take on a huge tight end who's trying to set the edge for you on the outside run play, then you know, he gets to tee off a little bit. And that will not be the case against Michigan. Uh, Trice is 275. They do have, like, <clears throat> inside, like, Ale's 320, 330, something like that. Yeah. They've got size. Mm -hmm. I, I, He's got I, some I do not think they are an undersized group, but it is a, uh, it's, it's going to be a different challenge than a lot of what they face throughout the season, for sure. I mean, styles make fights, and Michigan has also not faced a, like, top level passing offense. They did face a top level receiving core. Against but not Ohio a passing State. offense. But McCord was just not a good player in, for, for Ohio State in that game. So uh, there's a lot of unknown here. Um, you know what else is unknown? I have no idea what Michigan's going to do. Like, this is the sandbaggingest ass coaching staff in the country. <laughs> like, Marvin Harrison said after the, Michi after the game when they played this year, he's like, Michigan threw coverages at us that we didn't see on tape. You looked at the beginning of the Rose Bowl. They were in formations on offense. I hadn't seen them in all year. And now I haven't watched. I've gone back to watch the tape. I might be wrong, but watching the TV copy, I was like, what the hell is this? I haven't seen this. So I don't know if they've got anything special planned for this game that they've been saving because, like, they do that. Like, they they played basic-ass vanilla football for the first three and a half months of the season because they knew they could. And then they've saved a whole lot of stuff for these moments. And – they came back like their goal was to win the Big Ten. They thought they would do it. Their goal was to get to the playoff and win the damn thing this time. So they've I guarantee you they have been working on stuff for these games. 
cannot believe the greatest coach in college football history got out coached in the Rose Bowl. You know, I got into a discussion with this with Barrett on HQ yesterday. I don't know that he got out coached. I thought both coaching staffs did a tremendous job. Mm. I think Alabama was very confused at the beginning of the game because, again, like you saw, the secondary was like they were looking at each other like, what the hell are we supposed to do? I don't know who I'm supposed to cover because they were in formations they weren't ready for. But then at halftime, I thought Alabama made all the proper adjustments. Once they got into the locker room, that coaching staff fixed it. They cleaned things up, and they came out, and they were the better team in the third quarter. And then Michigan kind of adjusted again and actually went back to its early game script on offense on that final drive and in the overtime to get the touchdown drive. So I thought both coaching staffs did great in that game, and I know it's easy to say Nick got out coached. And I know Alabama fans are going to feel that way. I just think Michigan's players won the football game. I don't think it was a coaching battle. So speaking of coaches, as we pivot to the coaching matchup. And the adjustments were to be made by Alabama, mm -hmm. right? Like the, Michigan that was the team. dictated what yes. needed to happen. Michigan's adjustment was stop dropping punts. <laughs> yes. Right? You know, and, and JJ McCarthy, please hit open receivers when, when, when we ski in them open. Like if no adjustments were made, Michigan runs away with it mm -hmm. based on how the first half played yes. out in terms of like offense and defense. And also going back to like our preview, like Chip, and you were talking about, we were talking about like the Saban, like he's never lost, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's at the coaching advantage over Harbaugh. I kind of pushed back on that. Like McCarthy, I don't know if you saw his interview with uh, Dennis Dodd on the field after the game. They were talking about the, the play to Blake Corum on fourth down. And McCarthy said something that I thought was really interesting in that he says, well, we ran that play against them in 2019. And then he goes, well, he says, Hassan Haskins and Shea Patterson. I thought it was interesting that, JJ said we, but he said we saw like we went back to the 2019 game because the thing about Alabama's defense is, I mean, Nick Saban invented the way pretty much everybody plays pass coverage for the most part these days. But they've also not really, while they've adopted and they've adapted, they haven't really changed the general principles of what they're trying to do. And JJ says, well, we knew that if we put in this formation what these guys were going to do and the running back would come out completely free. It's like it was a got to have it play. You save it for these moments. And it's just that kind of game prep for, I don't think fans in general consider like that coaches put into these games. Like when you get to this level, there's so much this year, particularly the sign stealing and all this kind of stuff, blah, 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 knowing the plays. These teams know each other inside and out before they ever get on the field. And, and yes. Be, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, like to be fair, I, I was shocked at how well Bama played some of the stuff based on based on how they played it, how well they played it. it some of those condensed looks, I'm like, okay, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to have to check the zone here and they'll they'll, they'll play this over top and didn't. Mm -hmm. right? I mean the, the the one near McCarthy pick is Bama's DBs just bullied those Michigan receivers at the line of scrimmage. Like, holy mm -hmm. cow, like that should probably be a touchdown. Instead, it's almost a pick. Um so but yeah, like the, the ability to get them in in predictable coverage based on certain looks and run it at a certain time. Michigan had to be thrilled that Bama was still playing it the same way in the fourth quarter. They like to your point, Tom, they went back to it and they're like, Oh, we're getting the same look here. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is gonna score. All right. As as we pivot to the coaching matchup, I want to think about roster construction. I want to think about what's being represented here. Because if you just go, just go on like the 24 seven team talent composite these we are going to have a champion that is going to be one of the least talented again you know recruiting talent big big air quotes here on youtube.com slash cover three one of the least talented on paper national champions of the 21st century we also have the potential bud elliott i mean bud you you know, as, as I've discussed often, we have a lot of friends, right? We have, we have a lot of huge fans of the podcast. I'm leaving the Superdome. And you know what is the one thing that everybody's talking about? Everyone's what? buzzing? They say, chip, 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 chip. I'm like, what, 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 what? Do you know the blue chip implications here? Hey, is anybody, chip, have you talked about the blue chip implications? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, this is, this is a hot topic of conversation among many of our, you know, friends, colleagues, peers. Everyone wants to know, Chip, have you talked to Bud? What are the blue chip ratio implications? So I went back, you know, as we're as I'm working on the story, and I was like, looking, I was like, oh, Washington, Michigan, by the way, is 
as uh, as Bud calculated it going into the season. Michigan wins. The blue chip ratio stands. Washington did not make the 50%, though, before I jump into this, Bud included a section in his write-up on 24-7 Sports that said, you know, the transfer portal era, the extra year of eligibility has led to a lot of things that are uncommon to most of what college football has been over the last 20 years or so. And in one sentence, he said, so will, and he listed some teams, be the team to break that. And one of those teams that he mentioned was the Washington Huskies. He also mentioned Florida State. But he mentioned the Washington Huskies. And so you you recognize that if there were three or four teams that did not meet the blue chip ratio but could potentially win a national championship, Washington was one of them. So as you're looking at it, how, how do you – um, and how do you weigh these different roster construction, uh, transfer portal, you know, all, all the different factors going into what we have with these two teams right now and Washington's chances to break the blue chip ratio? First of all, I, I love that people are yelling at you about the blue chip ratio. This, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is fun. Um, so I, I always put in there like at some point this will end, like this is sports, we do have Cinderella type stuff. If it's going to happen, it's going to be like a really veteran team with a truly special quarterback because quarterback is, is always the position that changes things in our sport of football. Can Washington do it? I don't know. Like the Mariota, uh, Oregon team was a team that looked like they were going to do it. They stomped FSU in the Rose bowl. And then, you know what? Big, bad, physical, big 10 team came down the tracks and stomped them out in the cotton bowl. Right. We've had this come down a couple times. The first Clemson team, uh, almost busted it, right? With, with Deshaun and Nick Saban onside kick. Turns out, what did Deshaun go? Like top 20 picking yeah. the first, you know, first round quarterback is probably how it ends. We well, are in a really, sorry, we're saying, it's, it's Cam Newton in 2010 with that Auburn team, which like made blue chip barely, barely but yeah. like mm -hmm. overall doesn't check out on paper. 2016 Clemson, which made blue chip barely. That's the second game that you're talking about. Like, I'm TCU talking about the national year. champions, the, the ones right. that actually did win. So Auburn, Clemson, Clemson on paper, if you're just going recruiting rankings, like some of the lowest ranked. Cam yeah. Newton, Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence. So I, I always I, – I do want to point this out. Like I don't really – I don't rank them within the list. To me, there's a certain like minimum level of talent that you need to recruit over a four-year period so that the guys who are starting for you – like we could be confident they beat out other guys who also have a certain level of physical tools. But like, I, I don't see the winning percentage track for a team that's like 80 as opposed to 55, right? At Hello, a certain Texas point, right? Like there has to be a certain level, like, okay, we're getting enough clay in here that is moldable, like high level athleticism, frame, body type. And then it needs to also be player development and understanding the type of player that you need. And like, does the 70th guy on your roster, does he make sense for the scheme that you run? You know, some of these teams out there are kind of just talent collecting because they're like, Oh, this guy's rated four stars. And you know, sometimes he's, he's available for a reason. And you get into the adverse selection problem. It's like, Oh, maybe he's available for a reason. Right? So as long as you're at that level, I really do think the rest comes down you know, to develop and making sure you have decent balance across the roster, you know, so you don't have 14, four star and five star DBs, but the, 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 maybe you have positions that are just wide open. Washington's really interesting in this era. Obviously they do have some portal guys on the team who have helped. They also have nine sixth year COVID seniors, mm -hmm. which the portal is not going to go anywhere unless we get contracts in sports. And that, that's probably going to take a few years. The, super veteran nature of Washington might be sort of a high watermark here uh, within our sport because, you know, they have six year guys. Not oh, all six the six year guys, guys too. Play, like I, that was, that was my column on Monday night. I said, we're never going to see a team like this again. The COVID year is going to, yeah, the mm -hmm. COVID year is going to cycle out and like, we're all of a sudden going to shift. Like this is the most experienced title contending team that we've ever seen. And we'll probably ever see again. I mean, I generally think of like 18 programs that truly aspire and try to recruit to win a title. 
And like Washington is very like I think they're like 19th or 20th typically. Like they're kind of fringy in that way. And we have people in the chat talking about Ole Miss. I don't put Ole Miss in that group because they don't recruit high school at that level. But the fact that we have people believing, I think is good for the sport. I like the talent spreading out a whole lot. I don't know that Bama having a 90% blue chip ratio is good for the sport overall. Like we need villains, but it, you want your villains to, to have a fatal flaw, right? Now this year they did have one, but um, like you, you want them to feel beatable. And in some years they don't, but I think for our sport to have more fan bases believing is generally healthy. Now, the fact that we're getting that in the 14 playoff is actually kind of cool too, because we're going to have even more belief in the 12. Tom, what do you think about the talent between these two teams? I think Michigan's more talented. I think that both are very well coached. And I think that Washington being at a quote-unquote talent deficit is wiped out by having the better quarterback and the better wide receivers. And I think that's been the case for Washington pretty much the entire season. So it's... I. <laughs> I think that Michigan is going to win this game. I think Michigan can blow Washington out. I think Washington can win this game. I don't think Washington can blow Michigan out. Mm. So it's like when I look at the range of potential outcomes in my mind, based on what I've seen from both of these teams, and I will once again remind people that I said Washington was going to the playoff in September after it beat Michigan State, called them a wagon. What, can't you spell Washington without chip? Wagon. That's right. But I just think that the range of outcomes here, I think Michigan is the best team in the country. I think Michigan has been the best team in the country all season long. And I don't think that changes in this matchup. I think Michigan will be your national champion. 